On behalf of Georgetown University, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the 13th annual gathering of the Building Bridges Seminar. Founded in early 2002, in the wake of September 11th, first by then Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, and then embraced and sustained by his successor, Archbishop Rowan Williams. Building Bridges fosters engagement between Muslim and Christian scholars in the interest of contributing to public dialogue and deepening understanding between our faiths. Today is the first day of this year's Building Bridges, and I'm pleased to see so many members of our community, along with the seminar's esteemed scholars and leaders here for this afternoon's session where we will hear from two leading thinkers on the theme of our gathering, Sin, Forgiveness, and Reconciliation, Jonathan Brown and Veli Mati Kerkanen. I want to thank you both for your presence here and for sharing your scholarship and your reflections with us. This marks the sixth time that we have had the opportunity here at Georgetown to welcome the Building Bridges Seminar to one of our campuses. We were honored in 2012 when Archbishop Williams asked our community to assume stewardship of this extraordinary and important initiative and to ensure that the relationships, the scholarship, the dialogues that have been fostered during the last 13 years continue to grow and deepen. Throughout the years, Georgetown has built a meaningful partnership with Building Bridges, with many members of our community taking part in its fruitful study, reflection, and dialogue on issues facing Christians and Muslims, our face, and our world. And this work resonates deeply with our university's commitment to interreligious understanding. This commitment to creating conversations to deepen, deepening understanding among faiths cultures and peoples goes back to our founding in 1789. From our very first days, we were animated by a commitment and the words in our founding documents to, to freedom, to be open to students of every religious profession. John Carroll, our founder, who later became the first bishop of the Catholic Church in the United States, had a vision for a university grounded in the promise of the new American experiment, seeking to contribute new opportunities for greater religious freedom and tolerance. It was a vision that Georgetown should be both authentically American and authentically Catholic, committed to pluralism, inclusiveness, and support for the highest ambitions of this new country, and sim simultaneously devoted to the greater glory of God and the betterment of humankind. In the 225 years since, we continued to seek new ways and new opportunities to both reimagine and animate this commitment, a commitment to openness and to engagement with other faiths, all for the common good. We recognize in our current age, in the very context of world affairs that drove the Archbishop of Canterbury to found building bridges, that our world is growing smaller, nations are more interdependent, individuals more interconnected, the global community more in immediate contact with one another. But as our world has grown closer, it has become polarized and prone to conflict. And in such an environment, we must work to build bridges between communities of faith and religious traditions to foster interreligious understanding and interfaith dialogue this common good must be our common goal. Georgetown seeks to embrace this challenge and our Catholic and Jesuit identity compels us to meet it. Nearly 50 years ago in the final document of the Second Vatican Council, Nostra Aetate, the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church declared interreligious dialogue to be an essential aspect of Catholic life. And more recently in the 34th General Congregation in 1995, of the Society of Jesus, the religious order that was responsible for the, the, the formation of this institution, identified interreligious dialogue as fundamental to their mission of service to the church. It's our responsibility in the, in the academy to provide today's students with the tools and skills to engage the diversity and pluralism that characterize our world 
And further, furthermore, nowhere is the engagement between conflicting and competing traditions and cultures and disciplines so constant and so part of daily life as in the academy. This engagement is embedded in our mission, providing a place where bridges can be built between communities, including communities of faith, is one of the opportunities for our, our most significant work. So it is within this context of Georgetown's tradition, our history, and our commitment to intercultural and inter interreligious engagement that we are proud to be a part of the Building Bridges Seminar. And it's also within this context that we know that the convening of dialogue with scholars who bring extraordinary reserves of knowledge into shared study with one another can only yield deeper knowledge, deeper understanding, deeper connection, and peace. So I wanna thank you all for joining us today. And it's now my privilege to introduce to you the chair of the Building Bridges Seminar, Father, Father Dan Madigan of the Society of Jesus. Uh, Father Madigan came to Georgetown in 2008 as a member of the faculty in our Department of Theology. He teaches courses in Quranic studies, interreligious dialogue, and comparative theology. He also directs our theology department's graduate, graduate studies, including our PhD program on religious pluralism, and he serves as a senior fellow at Georgetown's Prince Awalid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. It's a great honor for me to introduce to you the Chair of Building Bridges, Father Dan Madigan. Thank you, Dr. DeJoya, and, and thank you all for, for coming this afternoon to be present at what is really just the beginning of uh, a rather long process, uh, the, the journey on which we embarked uh, with the Archbishops of Canterbury uh, some 12 or 13 years ago, depending which Archbishop you're talking about, uh, has been a long one uh, and an important one, and we're trying to do something a little unusual, a little new, uh, because as I said to the scholars gathered today for lunch, very often in interfaith work, we, we meet together for an afternoon, we say something, somebody else says something, there are questions from the audience, and you go away, and then uh, a couple of months later, you're back to square one, doing exactly the same thing, and this cycle goes on year after year. Many of us have had that experience. Building Bridges uh, is rather different in that we try to uh, create a space, and in this case it's a space of three and a half days, in which scholars can come to terms with, uh, or try to come to terms with the, the rather larger questions uh, of our faith, the faith of the two communities, questions uh, on which we differ, questions uh, in which we have a certain common language, but not always uh, the same reference to those language, languages. So uh, this is just the beginning, uh, and uh, I hope you, you are, are happy to be part of uh, these three and a half days. We will be disappearing after the reception uh, out into the wilds of Virginia uh, to the Airly Conference Center where we will be closeted away and we will work together in small groups, uh, Muslim and Christian scholars, uh, studying texts together. It is the Quranic texts and the biblical texts which ground our, uh, our discussions of these large questions and which uh, keep us focused. So this is not simply a matter of personal opinions, nor is it a matter of representatives of governments or of uh, particular parties or particular sects. Uh, we're very ecumenical, both on the Christian side and the Muslim side. These scholars uh, approach these texts as scholars, but also as believers uh, coming to terms with important theological questions. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce to you our two speakers who will give you an overview of the, the topic sin, forgiveness, reconciliation, which is our, our topic for these three days. Uh, the scholars themselves will have the opportunity to focus on sin tomorrow, so it'll be a rather bleak day. Uh, <laughs> forgiveness the next day, which will be a little happier, and, and reconciliation, which should bring everything together on Wednesday. 
but for you, you will get uh, an overview of, of these three uh, aspects of a single, um, a single reality. So our first speaker uh, is Professor Veli Mati Karkainen, uh, who is from Finland. Uh, he is Professor uh, of Systematic Theology at the Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. And he also teaches ecumenics at the University of Helsinki, which is where he did his doctorate. Uh, he's a, an author of many books, and at the moment he's working on a five-volume systematic theology. Uh, I have the first volume on my desk, uh, even opened, and, uh, and some of it read. Uh, and the other volumes will be coming out in, in successive years. So uh, Christ and Reconciliation appeared this year, Trinity and Revelation, Oh, sorry, last year, Trinity and Revelation uh, 2014, and Creation and Humanity will be next year. So uh, look for them on Amazon. Uh, Dr. Karkainen has done a, a great deal of work with the World Council of Churches, uh, Faith and Order Commission, and so uh, that is where we first met in, uh, uh, in the, a World Council of Churches meeting on Christian self-understanding in relation to other religions. So. Uh, Dr. Karkainen, would you like to take the floor? And then uh, I'll introduce our second speaker afterwards. It is certainly a great privilege and joy for me to be here with you and also make some remarks on this very important theme. However, I'm not here to teach, I'm more to share and learn from everybody. Sin and fall in Christian tradition. Let me begin with three observations as an orientation to sin and the fall in Christian theology. First, while all Abrahamic traditions believe that there is something wrong with us and the world because of sin, these three sister faiths do not envision its origins and results in the similar manner. Whereas Christian theological tradition speaks of original sin and even total depravity, Islamic tradition rejects such an interpretation. Second, even the Jewish and Christian interpretations based on the same scripture have widely differing theologies of sin. In Jewish theology, the fallen state of humanity is depicted in terms of being driven either by evil or good inclinations, and Adam plays virtually no role at all in contrast to the New Testament-based Christian exegesis. Third, against common intuitions within the Christian tradition, there are widely differing ways of conceiving the results of the fall and sin. To oversimplify a complex issue, we can describe the two main Christian traditions in the following manner. One, the less negative interpretation is that of the Eastern Orthodox Church in which the fall narrative is depicted as a stumbling of yet immature children in paradise, Adam and Eve. While of course a sad experience, the fall did not bring about original sin and certainly not divine judgment. Rather, judgment comes only as a result of wrong choices and acts. The effects of the fall are understood in the East more in terms of a wound inflicted in our nature. Second, the more negative interpretation is present in the traditions of the Christian West, which include Roman Catholicism, Anglicanism, and Protestant churches. Based on St. Augustine's theology, they speak of original sin as the result of Adam's disobedience. The sinfulness which results in divine judgment is inherited from generation to generation. That said, there is a divergence within the Christian West between the two main families. As will be discussed in the following, the Roman Catholic Church develops the Augustinian tradition somewhat differently from the Anglican and Protestant traditions. An important corollary issue behind theologies of sin and the fall is the question of the freedom of the will. Whereas in the Christian East, freedom of the will was not negated by Adam's disobedience, the Christian West 
following Augustine, denies the power of choice apart from divine restorative grace, except for freedom to choose wrongly, as um, Augustine put it. Before the fall, the human being was capable of not sinning, but that capacity was totally lost thereafter. Protestant and Anglican churches continued affirm, uh, affirming this Augustinian denial of freedom of the will, whereas in Roman Catholicism, mainly due to St. Thomas Aquinas, a somewhat less negative account of the will has developed. Recall Luther's 1525 work, The Bandits of the Will. In rebuttal of the Catholic humanist Erasmus of Rotterdam's 1524, the freedom of the will. Anglican and Protestant traditions also derived from Augustine the idea of double predestination, that is, from all eternity God has decided to save some and lead others to eternal damnation. The Eastern Church vehemently rejects that theory, and neither does Roman Catholicism teach it, despite all her indebtedness to Augustine. As mentioned, the figure of Adam plays a critical role in Christian theology of sin, not only because of the Genesis 3 narrative, but especially because of St. Paul's discussion in Romans chapter 5. It is widely agreed in contemporary Christian theology that even if in Pauline theology, the universality of sin is traced back to Adam, Romans 5.12, there is not yet an idea of sin as a fated universal legacy that proliferates uh, generation after generation like a congenital disease, Wolfhard Pannenberg. And although Paul teaches the universal occurrence of death, again, Romans 5.12, he does not speak of inheritance of sin in any technical sense. Eastern Orthodox theology followed that tradition in understanding the example and sin of Adam as representing the whole race instead of linking this notion to the idea of inheritance of sin. It is highly significant that patristic theology for centuries did not have a developed doctrine of sin other than a deep intuition of the fallen and sinful nature of humanity. Only with St. Augustine, as mentioned, at the turn of the fifth century was a technical doctrine of original sin worked out in the West. The basic idea is that when Adam sinned, we participated in it. This interpretation was supported by the faulty Latin translation of Romans uh, 5.12, which uh, translated the Greek "epoh" as in whom, that is, when Adam transgressed, we, the human race, participated in his sin, and we inherit this fallen nature from our parents. We are therefore guilty and condemned as a result. In the Christian East, the human person was regarded as mortal, even before the fall, and hence death per se cannot be punishment for the fall. Human nature is intact even after the fall and is good by virtue of existing as the imago Dei, and free will is not destroyed by the fall. In this Eastern interpretation, we do not inherit sin, but rather its consequences, particularly corruption and mortality. In other words, the East followed the Hebrew mindset in which even the concept of original sin is not a standard term. While the universality of sin is affirmed in Eastern theology, it is often described, as mentioned, in terms of woundedness or sickness. Having now described the differences of interpretations of sin and the fall in Christian tradition, let me add the following important remarks, lest I be misunderstood. Notwithstanding many disagreements among the Christian traditions concerning the hermeneutics of fall and original sin, there is no denying the simple fact that, as the uh, late reformed Paul Truett puts it, while no religious vision has ever esteemed humankind more highly than the Christian vision, no other tradition has also judged it more severely. End quote. Similarly, the great ethicist theologian of the past generation, Richard Niebuhr, reminds us, quote, 
a theology which fails to come to grips with this tragic factor of sin is heretical both from the standpoint of the gospel and in terms of its blindness to obvious facts of human experience in every realm and on every level of moral goodness." End quote. In sum, all Christian traditions believe that something is wrong with us and the world to the point that unless God in his grace and mercy stoops down to our level and forgives us, we are indeed without hope. To that gracious divine offering of forgiveness and reconciliation we turn next, but before that, an important additional note concerning the challenges brought about by modernity and the Enlightenment. As a result of the dramatic changes in our worldview, thanks to scientific breakthroughs, including the acceptance among mainline Christian traditions of the evolutionary worldview, and the account of the emergence of the cosmos in light of contemporary physical sciences, Christian theology of sin has to revise some of its key assumptions without in any way softening the fact of our sinfulness. The traditional assumptions in need of revision include the historicity of Adam and Eve, the innocence of the paradise, the linking of sin with our physical death, and the timing of the fall. Very briefly, this means that universal sinfulness can be affirmed in the context of evolutionary theories view of the slow emergence of humanity without succumbing to traditional doctrines. Rather than being historical, the Genesis 3 narrative of Adam and even Eve is understood as a myth that nevertheless contains an important religious truth. As a result, the idea of innocence of paradise is neither uh, directly taught in the Bible, nor is reasonable in light of evolutionary emergence theory. Finally, physical death cannot be made the function of the fall. Death and decay has been in place for billions and billions of years before the emergence of humanity and simply characterizes the finite life of the creature. This shift has already happened among Christian churches, apart from most traditional and conservative communities, particularly here in the US, similarly to mainline Jewish traditions. I would be interested to hear from my Muslim uh, brothers and sisters their sense of how contemporary Muslim theology has dealt with these uh, same challenges of modernity and evolutionary theory. Now to divine forgiveness and reconciliation. All Abrahamic traditions anchor the possibility of forgiveness and reconciliation in God. Indeed, in forgiveness, the grace of God is ultimately at work. Using their own distinctive terminology, both Judeo-Christian and Islamic scriptures extol the merciful and gracious nature of God. Even the different diagnoses of the sinfulness of humanity do not make these foundational theological statements obsolete. The distinctively Christian teaching is the linking of forgiveness and reconciliation in the atonement theology, that is, God became human in Jesus Christ incarnation, suffered and died for our sins, and in his glorious resurrection gained victory over judgment and death. This kind of atonement theology is, of course, uh, not part of either Jewish or Islamic theology, and indeed is uh, strongly opposed by both. Similarly to the doctrine of sin, Christian tradition speaks of atonement in more than one voice. Although all Christian traditions affirm this Christological and Trinitarian basis of atonement. For the first millennium or so, the main way of speaking of atonement had to do with so-called Christus Victor, Christ the champion metaphors, which focus on incarnation, resurrection and theosis, deification, less than uh, judgment and sin. Rather than speaking of atonement mainly in terms of guilt and judgment, which became the focus in the Christian West beginning from the medieval period, this recapitulation theory of atonement, St. Irenaeus and others, puts the main emphasis on overcoming corruption and mortality by virtue of participation in the divine life. Many other metaphors of uh, atonement emerged from the beginning of the second millennium, including satisfaction theory, Anselm, 
moral example, Peter Appelard, penal, penal substitution, Protestant reformers, and so forth. They are but complementary ways of embracing the multifaceted and rich salvific benefits of Christ's work on our behalf. While divine uh, forgiveness is the foundation and source, Christian tradition, in keeping with the common teaching of all Abrahamic traditions, also emphasizes the importance of forgiveness and reconciliation among human beings and among human communities. This section will focus uh, here on divine forgiveness and the third one on forgiveness among men and women. The topic of forgiveness is treated widely in the biblical tradition. Just recall its centrality in the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth and of his followers. Forgiveness is also mentioned in the Ecumenical Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed 381 in connection with the Holy Spirit and the Church. Indeed, in the life of the Church, forgiveness is also integrally linked to its sacramental life, particularly water baptism and the Eucharist. The Christian notion of divine forgiveness is, of course, deeply indebted to Jewish scriptures. Although turning to God, repentance is required, for example, 2 Kings 17, meaning that refusal to do so may lead to withdrawal of uh, forgiveness. The later prophets of the Old Testament also emphasize that what really matters is the right attitude rather than mechanical following of cultic practices. In the New Testament Gospels, in the Christian scriptures, the main words used for forgiveness are afiemi, let go, cancel, remit, leave, and aphesis, release, pardon, cancel. That the term forgiveness appears very rarely in the rest of the New Testament outside the Gospels does not mean that therefore the idea of forgiveness in the New Testament is marginal. On the contrary, St. Paul and others refer to the idea on the concept of forgiveness using a host of other metaphors, such as justification, reconciliation, redemption, and the like. And even in the Gospels, the idea of forgiveness may be present even if the word is missing, as in the parable of the prodigal son in Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. If forgiveness is based on divine mercy, are there any conditions for its reception? What is striking about Jesus' ministry is the seeming generosity of the uh, offer of forgiveness. Not only did he pronounce forgiveness to sinners, a technical term for those outside the covenant, but Jesus Christ even included them, the sinners, in the table fellowship, which is the highest sign of the inclusion in the ancient cultures. On the other hand, there is no denying the link between repentance and forgiveness, both in Jesus' own ministry and in keeping with that of his predecessor, John the Baptist. Furthermore, the link between um, forgiveness and repentance uh, was also is given by the risen Lord uh, in the mandate to the disciples, and the early church carries on with the same tradition. So what are we to make of the relationship between repentance and forgiveness. While Christian tradition, again, does not speak unanimously, it seems to me that according to the mainstream New Testament witness, neither repentance nor any other human preparation should be made a first prerequisite. God unilaterally makes forgiveness possible by offering forgiveness while we were not sinners, while we were yet sinners, Romans 5.8. That said, it also seems to me that while divine forgiveness is unconditional, based as it is on God's mercy and atonement gained by the salvific work of Christ, its reception calls for repentance. In other words, repentance rather than a precondition is a necessary result or consequence of divine forgiveness. In other words, the refusal to repent means saying no to the divine offer of forgiveness. This principle of unconditional forgiveness should also guide our understanding of forgiveness among human persons. We are called to forgive our enemies and violators simply because God has forgiven us. And that is our last topic. Forgiveness and reconciliation among human persons and communities. 
While God's forgiveness is the basis and source, all Abrahamic traditions also emphasize the necessity of extending forgiveness to the neighbor and even to the enemies. Similar to the Holy Quran, the shared uh, scripture between Jews and Christians, namely Old Testament, contains a number of well-known historical narratives of forgiveness, such as Joseph forgiving his brothers, Moses to the people of Israel, and David to his son Absalom. Jesus, of course, spoke often of the need to extend forgiveness not only to our neighbors, but even those who violate and hate us. Having received divine forgiveness, an unconditional gift, we humans are called to imitate the act of hospitality. In forgiving, humans mediate the gift of forgiveness they have received themselves. Miroslav Wolf locates forgiving in the context of two opposing movements, namely embrace or exclusion. Exclusion may happen in so many ways in our lives, including elimination, as in ethnic cleansing, assimilation, when acceptance is based on the demand to be like us, domination, and abandonment. Embrace, in contrast, is based on, as he says, the outstretched arms of Christ on the cross for the godless, the welcoming by the Father of the prodigal son. This will to embrace includes both opening to the other and drawing into intimate touch and opening the arms letting go, making space for the otherness of the other, Miroslav Wolf. God has reconciled the world to himself, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 5, 17 to 20. And God empowers humans to spread that reconciling influence at the personal and communal levels. The one who forgives refuses to pay back the violator. Forgiveness is a costly effort. It calls for self-sacrifice. It often hurts. In this sense, it can be said that the victim undergoes suffering in two moments. First, in the act of being violated against, and then in the willingness to suffer in offering the gift of forgiveness. Psychologists tell us that forgiveness is good for your soul. It has positive effects on the one who forgives. While that may be true, in Christian faith, that goal is secondary. Forgiveness is not done primarily for the sake of uh, one's own well-being, but because of neighborly love to which followers of Christ are called in the imitation of the Heavenly Father who loves without any conditions and without any distinctions. It is done for the sake of others. Indeed, forgiveness is also done for the benefit of the violator. Forgiveness helps the willing, the willing violator to begin the process of reconciliation and his own healing. Offering forgiveness not only helps the violator to deal with the past, forgiveness also points to the future opportunity. It is an act of trust. A long tradition of philosophical and theological reflection of forgiveness has linked forgiveness with resentment. In this view, we are told, forgiveness primarily means a process of overcoming resentment, the feeling of anger caused by having been the object of wrongdoing. A version of this view is that forgiveness is supposed to free the wronged person from all forms of negative feelings, even disappointment. While it certainly is a good thing to get beyond resentment, it has little to do with the theology of forgiveness as presented by Jesus. Jesus invites us not only to turn the other cheek, but uh, which of course entails a real experience of being wronged and embrace in forgiveness the offender, but, Jesus also, but also to expose the wrong act for the sake of justice and for the possibility of the wrongdoer to find reconciliation in accepting guilt and receiving forgiveness. It has to be said definitely that forgiveness does not trump justice and righteousness. Restoration cannot happen without the wrongdoing being exposed and judged. Hence the folk psychologist's advice, forgive and forget, uh, is a profoundly mistaken idea. The one who is concerned about both justice and reconciliation must learn how to remember rightly. 
Forgiveness does not mean instant or, or even long-term eraser of the victim's memory. Recalling rightly is required for the sake of exposing and touching all wrongdoings. Jesus said, Matthew 18, 15, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But we have to understand that this condemnation of wrong act is not based on the principle of retributive justice. It is not about vengeance. It is about reconciling justice, which may lead to healing. Remembering rightly is needed for the sake of healing both uh, of the victim and the wrongdoer. Mere forgetting can be nothing more than a way of repressing negative memories and leave the victim with the enmity and hatred. Rather than forgetting or suppressing the act of wrongdoing, its recalling helps the violator to ask for and receive forgiveness and be reconciled with the victim, with oneself and with God. The violator who accepts forgiveness also accepts the condemnation of the wrong act. By refusing to receive forgiveness, the offender lets others know that he or she did nothing wrong. That blocks the way to reconciliation with the other people and God, and it blocks the way for healing. Christian theology of atonement and forgiveness condemns violence and wrongdoings. It also helps stop it and save us from the cycle of revenge. Maximus the Confessor put it succinctly. He said, the death of Christ on the cross is a judgment of judgment. Violence may happen both at personal and communal or even societal levels. The common task for all Abrahamic traditions is to collaborate in stopping violence. The Rwandan theologian Celestin Musekura, whose country has experienced a colossal massacre and violence, has called churches and religious communities to become communities of forgiveness and reconciliation. He writes, forgiveness as a virtue is learned not in an isolated, self-excluded life, but rather in a community of faith where members of the community experience the reality of sin and brokenness together. Today's stories of genocide, mass murder, racism, tribalism, religious wars, terrorism, and church conflicts indicate not only the fragility of our commitment to life in community of friendship and embrace, but also how difficult it is for individuals to unlearn the habits of, sin of uh, sins of exclusion by domination, elimination, abandonment, and assimilation, and to the extreme by genocide." End quote. This reconciliatory work should also lead us to the work of peace building and conflict resolution. Recently, the World Council of Churches International Ecumenical Peace Convention made this programmatic, this, uh, programmatic statement. It says, we understand peace and uh, peacemaking as an indispensable part of our common faith. Peace is inextricably related to the love, justice, and freedom that God has granted to all human beings through Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit as a gift and vocation. It constitutes a pattern of life that reflects human participation in God's love for the world. End. Amen. Thank you very much, Matti. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a whole range of uh, positions that we could be described as, as Christian, uh, and I think it's an important element in, in what we do here that we, we do not try to find simple answers to, to very complex questions. Our second speaker uh, is Dr. Jonathan Brown, who is uh, Associate Professor here in... Uh, I'm sorry, I've got my... Oh, I've lost it. Here it is. Get the titles right. Associate Professor of Islam and Muslim Christian Relations uh, in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. He's Associate Director also of the uh, Prince Al Walid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. Uh, Jonathan is a hometown boy, 
he did his undergraduate uh, degree here and then his doctorate at the University of Chicago. Uh, he studied and conducted research in Egypt, Syria, Turkey, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, South Africa, Indonesia, India, and Iran. So he's uh, much traveled. Uh, he has a number of books out in, in the recent years, uh, and uh, his latest is about to come out from One World Publications. It's entitled, rather tantalizingly, Misquoting Muhammad, The Challenges and Choices of Interpreting the Prophet's Legacy. Uh, he is editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Islamic Law. Professor Brown. Hello. Um, uh, greetings to everybody, and thanks very much to the, to the organizers of the, of the Building Bridges program for inviting me. Um, uh, I start by saying, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. And um, this, these three issues of human sin, uh, divine forgiveness, and human reconciliation are, are not small issues. And as I was trying to figure out what I could possibly say about these three topics, I, I did what I usually do when I get stumped, is I just read uh, gossip news. And lo and behold, the answer fell in my lap, which was the following story. Uh, which I'll mention, which was in The Guardian. A few weeks ago, in the northern Iranian city of Nur, a murderer was taken to the gallows. With the rope around his neck, blindfolded and grimacing with fear, he heard a woman's voice cry out. It was the mother of his victim, announcing at the last moment that she forgave the killer for his crime. Tears streaming down his face, the condemned man was released from the noose. The, his mother rushed to embrace the mother of his victim, and both sobbed, one over a son lost, one over a son regained. The man had been convicted of the crime of murder. Had he in, he in fact committed that sin, it is possible that the witnesses who testified in court had lied, leading to a false conviction. It's also possible that the judges had not noticed that somehow in the heat of an argument, the man had acted in self-defense. Only God knows. As Muslim scholars, in their capacity as judges, have insisted for centuries with a veteran legal maxim, quote, we have been commanded to rule on what is evident, and God knows the hearts. All that the Sharia court in Nur knew was that the evidence and procedure had determined that in this world at least, the man had taken the life of another and the victim's family had rights. As declared by the Quran, quote, retaliatory punishment has been ordained for you in the matter of murder. Although it was the right of the victim's family to see the killer executed, the Quran also allowed them to accept monetary compensation or even to forgive the killer entirely. This had been the course taught by the Prophet Muhammad, who had never ruled, who had never ruled on a case of murder without urging the victim's kin to forgo the punishment and forgive the murderer. There is, no perhaps, there is perhaps no better way for me to convey the possibility of human reconciliation here on Earth than the image of the two Iranian mothers embracing. The victim's mother had decided to forgive the killer at the last moment after her son appeared to her in a dream, telling her that he was in paradise as a martyr, all his sins forgiven. What fate awaits this killer, spared for now in the afterlife? The Quran warns that, quote, whosoever slays a believer intentionally, his reward is hellfire forever. Humans can forgive each other, but God forgives whom he wills. Only a few Muslim countries are still ruled by God's law, the Sharia. But this episode in Iran is illustrative of how the Islamic tradition has conceived of the three daunting themes of human sin, divine forgiveness, and human reconciliation. In those moments on the gallows, we can glimpse the vertical and horizontal axes linking them. Man sins against God, offending upwards an all-powerful, invincible creator. And man sins against man, injuring an all-too-vulnerable fellow human being, a human being whom God has created, has, has granted the right to repair. God forgives, sending his mercy down upon sinners. God forgives and perhaps his mercy spreads amongst the people. 
humans forgive and begin to reconcile, in a sense, reflecting God's mercy. Let us look at each of these elements in turn. At the base of the vertical axis of sin and forgiveness connecting man and God lies our own human nature. All too familiar to us, Revelation tells us more of our human proclivity to sin, our vile baseness in iniquity, and our glory in righteousness. Mankind is hasty, the Quran says, ungrateful, quick to despair, too liable to follow the herd around him as opposed to the right guidance of God's messengers. As God describes in the Quran, quote, indeed we created man in the best of forms, and then we reduced him to the lowest of the low, except those who believe and do good deeds. When the children of Adam, quote, assail the obstacle, the loftier but more difficult of the two paths laid out by God before them, by acknowledging their Lord and doing right, they rise higher than angels, who praise and worship God constantly, but who could never do other than that. But when the children of Adam deny their Lord and sin, making their own desires their gods, then, quote, they are no more than beasts, nay, farther astray than them. Unlike animals, these reprobates chose their torpid path, while animals do no more than follow their nature and thus praise God along with trees and heavenly bodies. At the top of the vertical axis of sin and divine forgiveness is God's response to our actions. That of, quote, the best of judges, as the Quran says, who, quote, does not wrong any of his servants. Those who denied him in this life and did evil, quote, will be engulfed in what they were wont to do. And the fires and torments of hell will be an otherworldly manifestation of their vile conduct and misguided beliefs. For those who believe and do good deeds, however, their good will be magnified. God promises in the Quran that he will, quote, ward off from them the worst of their deeds and will reward them for the best of what they used to do. Thus, alongside God's justice at the top of the vertical axis is his infinite mercy towards his creation. In response to Moses' plea for aid in dealing with the recalcitrant Israelites before Mount Sinai, God responds that he will grant felicity to those who believe and do good deeds. My punishment, the Quran says, I strike with it those whom I wish, and my mercy encompasses all things. The Quran instructs Muhammad to say, O oh, my servants who have trespassed against themselves, do not despair from the mercy of God, for indeed God forgives all sins. Indeed, he is most forgiving and merciful. God warns that he forgives all sins except associating partners with him, the sin of shirk. But even this limit is qualified, concluded Muslim scholars, since those who repent, as well as those pagans or non-Muslims, who never knew Islam or never knew of its true teachings, they are all forgiven for their idolatry and their misguidance. God instructs Muhammad to tell those new converts to Islam who have repented their former ways that their sins are forgiven for, quote, the, as the Quran says, your Lord has prescribed mercy upon himself because as God decreed before the creation of the heaven and the earth, my, worse, my mercy overwhelms my anger. God can even forgive the worst sinners. O child of Adam, the prophet tells us, God says, O child of Adam, even if your sins reached as high as the ladders of the sky, and then you ask my forgiveness, I would forgive you. Because of the enormity of God's mercy, and because the scope of his cosmic justice so far exceeds our ken, the result is that we cannot know who will enter heaven and who will not. Muhammad once told the story of two Jews in ancient times, one of whom was pious and admirable, and the other of whom was an open sinner. The righteous man would tell his friend to amend his ways, to which the sinful man would reply, leave me be, me and my Lord. Finally, the pious man told his friend, God will never forgive you or allow you to enter the garden of heaven. When both their souls were taken up upon death, God said to the pious man, did you know me or control my power? God bestowed his ultimate clemency and paradise upon the iniquitous man and condemned the otherwise pious man to hell for the sin of arrogance. We cannot know how God will judge any mortal, and it is sheer hubris to delimit his mercy. This brings us to the horizontal axis, namely our temporal judgment of sin in the earthly world. 
Here we are torn between two undeniable truths we have already mentioned. On the one hand, God has made clear to us that certain beliefs and actions displease him, denying his blessing and his bounty, believing that others besides him can help us or harm us, slander, lying, dishonoring one's parents, stealing, intoxication, backbiting. These are all sins. As the Quran states, quote, God forbids shameful deeds and what is wrong and overweening. Muslims of all sects have agreed that it is a Muslim's duty to enjoin right and forbid wrong. And some of these sins require the temporal authorities to punish those who commit them here on earth. Such was the case with the murder in Iran. Whoever takes a life unjustly has committed so tremendous a sin in God's eyes that, as the Quran states, it is as if he has killed all of humankind. Along the horizontal axis, it is left to those empowered with judgment in state and society to assure that the family of the slain receives justice. On the other hand, however, we cannot be sure of any necessary link between the horizontal and the vertical, between the enormity of a sin or false belief and the fate of the sinner in the afterlife. The labels of believer or unbeliever, Christian, Muslim, or Jew, are thus only markers of legal faith, iman shar'i, legal faith, or the confessional categories into which people fit to determine their legal relationships to each other, their rights and obligations. They have no necessary link to faith of conscience, iman fitri, or an individual's faith in God, which ultimately determines his or her salvific destiny. A Muslim is buried in a Muslim graveyard, a Christian in a Christian one. A Muslim, a Christian man cannot marry a Muslim woman according to the Sharia. Muslims can be prosecuted for drinking and intoxication or for selling wine, while Christians cannot. Of course, this does not mean that Muslims make no assertions about the rightness or wrongness of beliefs. The Quran says, whoever de desires other than Islam as a religion, it will not be accepted from him, and he will be amongst the lo losers in the world to come. That's a whole other conference. Maybe it's already happened. Uh, but I, I had to include that, that verse. Uh, but merely belonging to the formal legal and social category of those following the correct religion means nothing for an individual's fate. Someone who is legally a Muslim may suffer horrendously in hellfire for his personal atheism, gross mis misconduct, or perfidious acts. A God-fearing Christian may attain salvation long before this Muslim on the basis of his belief in God and good deeds. According to Muslim, both Sunni and Imami Shiite doctrine, all monotheists will one day enter paradise after the torments of hell have burned their sins away. Thus, a Muslim, as Muslim scholars often cite in their didactic poems, do not declare that any one person will go to hell, nor to heaven if you follow Muhammad's precedent. The clarity of what constitutes crimes and the rules that God has revealed for adjudicating human conduct, taken along with the unknowable perfection of God's justice and the magnitude of his mercy, constrain our treatment of sin in this world to the realm of formalism. Along the horizontal axis of human reconciliation, this formalism is accompanied by an emphasis on the value of reconciliation above and independent of which party is right and which party is wrong. The Quran reads, if two parties among the believers battle one another, then reconcile between them. But if one of them transgresses beyond bounds against the other, then fight you all against the one that transgresses until it complies with the command of God. But if it then complies, Make peace between them with justice and equity, for God loves those who are fair. The believers are brethren, so reconcile peacefully between your two, two brothers and fear God that you may receive his mercy. The vanity of conflict between the children of Adam, even and perhaps particularly when one group feels assured of God's favor, is clear also when the Quran instructs Muslims on dealing with non-Muslims in conflict. Muhammad is told in the Quran how to approach 
the enemy non-Muslim tribes who are fighting the Muslims. But if the enemy inclines toward peace, the Quran says, then incline towards peace also, and trust in God, for indeed he is the all-hearing and omniscient. While writing about jihad, one 16th century Egyptian scholar recalled a story of King David. While building the temple, everything David constructed would crumble. God spoke to him saying, my house will not be erected by the hands of one who has shed blood. David pleaded that he had only ever fought wars in God's name. Indeed, God replied, but were those who died not also my servants? Acts like that of the Iranian mother granting clemency to her son's killer is as close as one I can think to a pure act of mercy. But in other cases of humans wronging each other, the essential role of mercy in human reconciliation is clear. A party must be willing to offer the amorphous gift of mercy rather than insisting formally on its rights. This was a central theme in the procedure of Sharia courts, and I think also in the less glamorous mundane affairs of uh, family courts here in the US. Throughout, the Islamic, throughout Islamic civilization, judges followed the dictum that peaceful reconciliation is best, which comes from the Quran. Even if one party had clearly wronged the other, it was always deemed best if both parties could compromise and meet on middle ground. This would ultimately reduce the possibility of further conflict. Eventually, the horizontal axis of human ex humans extending mercy to one another, whether in the course of reconciliation or not, this axis angles upward once again to the divine. The Prophet Muhammad's teachings emphasize that humans' acts of mercy are reflections of the apotheosis of mercy in the Godhead, but they are not disinterested acts, as reflecting God's mercy is an act of worship and thus has its rewards. The Prophet says in one hadith, those who are merciful, the most merciful God has mercy upon them. Be merciful in this world, and he that is in the heavens will have mercy upon you. In another saying, Muhammad teaches that, quote, he who is not merciful will be granted no mercy. Even in the case of the Iranian mother pardoning her son's killer, the Quran emphasizes that the benefits of such forgiveness accrue to both parties. It's mutual. The family of the slain can demand reciprocation, but as the Quran continues, quote, whosoever forgoes it out of charity, this is an expiation of his or her wrongs. So the party that forgoes the punishment and grants forgiveness, that act of forgiveness is an expiation of their own sins. Mercy and reconciliation thus become the acts of, acts of worship directed upwards along the axis to God, accompanied by the promise of mercy sent downward in return. In addressing these complicated and vast topics, I have most, almost certainly neglected much that should have been said and may well have said something incorrect. Rather than closing with a conclusion, I think I'll leave you with a, at least one fully open can of worms. Submerged gleefully in the Baroque scholarship of the, and scholasticism of the 19th century, a leading Muslim scholar noted the question of whether someone who has committed a crime such as fornication or murder can excuse himself by citing divine preordination. God willed this for me. God willed that I do this. One can indeed cite predestination to avoid blame, the scholar says. In Sunni Islam, people only have the illusion of free will. But you cannot cite predestination to avoid the mandated punishment or liability dictated by God's law. He cites, the scholar cites as an evidence, his evidence, a saying of the prophet that caused great controversy in the classical Islamic period in the 800s and the 900s when Muslim scholars debated hotly over the question of free will versus predestination. In this story, uh, or sorry, uh, in, in the Quran, Adam sins in the Garden of Eden and fell from it, but God forgave mankind that original sin. The prophet tells of the souls of Adam and Moses meeting in heaven. And Moses confronting Adam over his having cost all mankind a blissful life in the garden. 
How could you, O Moses, whom God has purified as a prophet and given the Torah, Adam says, how could you blame me for an act that God ordained for me long before the creation of the heavens and the earth? And so, Muhammad concluded, Adam trumped Moses. Thank you very much. I, th I think you'll see from, from those two uh, talks taken together that there are various points at, at which one hears an echo uh, of an idea from one or the other tradition. Uh, one, if one listens attentively, one can, can see uh, there is a point where there's a clear difference or there is, a, there is a point where we could discuss, there is a point where we might take this in another direction. Uh, so before I open the floor to your comments and questions, uh, I might just ask our two speakers if, uh, if there's something uh, they would like to ask one another or some observation that they would like to make uh, about the relationship between the two things they said. I have a question, but it's going to take too long. It's going to have to take a couple of days to get answered, so I'll, I'll forego it. I would like to, Jonathan. I, yeah. Jonathan, I would like to ask. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very enlightening and interesting presentation. Um, I already learned a lot, and I read your presentation before. Um, I alluded in my presentation that um, we Christians um, read the Adam and Eve narrative. Uh, in uh, our Bible differently from the way the Quran uh, talks about what happened to Adam and Eve. There are about two or three such accounts uh, in your Holy Scripture. Would you like to tell us uh, briefly, and you already made a brief reference, but could you tell us briefly how uh, the Islamic um, tradition understands what were the implications of the fall to Adam and Eve, and then to the rest of us. Um, I'll, do my, I'll do my best. I think the, the best uh, section is in the Quran, chapter 20, verse 122, around 124. It's the, the episode is, of the fall is mentioned at cert, uh, about three points, I think, in the Quran. But uh, the, I think the most illustrative set of verses discusses so like in, in the Bible, um, the, uh, the Adam is, is told not to eat from, uh, from a tree. And uh, uh, then he's, he's tempted to eat from this, this tree. And uh, he does so. And then um, God confronts him for, for disobeying him and casts him, uh, him and his 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 descendants out of the garden. Uh, but uh, Adam immediately uh, repents and uh, you know, recognizes his own failing in what he had done. And then uh, God uh, accepts that forgiveness and has mercy on Adam and on his descendants. But because, um, and to go to that, that story of Moses and Adam, because uh, Adam has disobeyed God, there's no going back to a state of, of innocence, right? So falling out of the garden, even if you're forgiven, uh, you're, you're no longer innocent. I think that's, uh, that, that's when, when you were talking about you know, forgive and forget is, is not correct. I think in this sense, it's exactly the same idea, which is that you can forgive somebody, but once they've sinned or hurt you or committed some wrong, uh, they're their um, existence or their place in your eyes will always, be, will, will always be altered. So there's no way for humanity, and Adam sort of standing in here for all of humanity, there was no way for, Ad, for humanity to go back to uh, a state of, of innocence. Um, but I think unlike the, the accounts you described in the, in the Christian tradition, or at least in, in certain aspects of, the, of, of Western Christianity, it's not um, thought of as a, a, a you know, genetic, uh, flaw that is sort of passed on as the sin throughout humanity. It's simply the, the, this fact that human beings have now, um, you know, uh, fallen out of the original state of innocence. 
sure you don't want to ask the question. Just well, yeah, I mean, I, okay, I, I, maybe I feel like people have the same question too. The, what is the, I, I, it's a huge question. So how, how does, um, how does Jesus' sacrifice uh, on the cross uh, redeem the sins of mankind? Is it that it's like, is it a payment for sins committed? Or is it uh, something that humans see and then want to emulate? It is indeed a, a big uh, question. Can we take up the next one? <laughs> the New Testament, um, the, the, uh, the distinctively Christian scripture, um, fortunately enough, uh, uses a number of uh, metaphors or um, approaches or perspectives in uh, talking about how what happened to Jesus um, may um, and is uh, salvific uh, to us. And I will uh, mention a few of those uh, in a moment. But the basic idea in, in Christian understanding of how forgiveness um, may happen is that um, even the best of us cannot uh, save oneself. Even though good deeds and good behavior is a good thing, um, apart from divine intervention, uh, according to all Christian traditions, uh, humanity cannot be saved. And therefore, at the heart of our uh, Trinitarian confession of faith is the idea that in Christ, uh, the second person of the Trinity, uh, Almighty God has taken uh, place of humanity or has become one of us. And now, uh, w w but thereafter, there are a number of different um, complementary approaches in the New Testament. Sometimes a sacrificial uh, terminology is used going back to the Old Testament where the idea is that um, uh, having uh, finished a sacrifice uh, or, for example, having uh, shed the blood of an innocent um, uh, vicarious uh, victim, uh, forgiveness may come. Sometimes it is a matter of uh, paying a debt, as uh, like even culturally we know that one way of talking about uh, forgiveness is like incurring a debt, and so uh, somebody else who has uh, money, who has uh, resources, uh, pays the debt. Other times, um, it is uh, talked about in terms of um, Christ, uh, like uh, I'm saying, building a bridge between a, a hostile human person and a loving God. So there are a number of different theories, like we call them theories of atonement in Christian theology, um, how what happened to Jesus uh, may be salvific, but all Christian traditions agree that um, without, or, or uh, if all uh, Christian traditions agree that um, had God not um, intervened um, in the um, affairs of the world, uh, forgiveness uh, would not be available to us. I think you have there a very good example of uh, one of the benefits of this kind of conversation. Uh, when Christians speak uh, among themselves theologically, we use all sorts of language which we haven't always uh, digested. Of course, it's been digested over the centuries, but we've learned that language and we've learned ways of speaking of things. Uh, and we don't always recognize how it sounds to people outside of the tradition. Uh, we don't always recognize that it prompts questions like Jonathan's question to Veli Mati, uh, which is an obvious question. Uh, and it's a good question. And, and it's in this mutual questioning that our respective theologies become deeper. Muslims are, are also in the same position. Over centuries, they've been saying various things to one another uh, in their own internal conversation about, about sin and forgiveness. And when a Christian comes into that 
theological space, uh, in this act of mutual theological hospitality, uh, we pose questions about the way something is said, about the presumption that lies behind it. Uh, and the experience has always been in the Building Bridges seminars that this, uh, it puts us on the spot, of course, uh, but that being put on the spot theologically is something which uh, generates new insight. Uh, new insight not just for the interfaith uh, work, but new insight for our own uh, internal um, theological processes. So that having been said, uh, I, let me open the floor to others. We, we have a roving mic, uh, and so if you, if you don't speak into the mic, you will not get on the tape. So we, please wait until the microphone comes to you. So uh, please t tell us your name and uh, yeah. who you would like to address your question to. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, shalom. Assalamu alaikum. Peace unto you. My name is Zarif Ahmad. Before introduction, I am a member of Ahmadiyya Muslim community, the follower of the promised Messiah. Mission is peace, global peace in the world. And if you want further information, our global, uh, official website is www.alislam.org. So this is brief in introduction. Uh, for myself, now my question is that... For which uh, speaker? Uh, to Christian speaker. Yes. If one sin of Adam and Eve need a son of God to be sacrificed, just one sin, at this time while West, uh, well, Christianity is in West, in America, all over the world, and all, almost all of the humanity is deep from top to toe into sins. How many sons of God are now needed to part uh, delivering from them from sins? Thank you for a uh, profound question. Um, let me try to frame my response uh, in the widest possible manner. And I'll begin a little bit uh, from the history. Christian theology has two kinds of um, answers to the question of why incarnation had to happen, why uh, God had to uh, become one of us in Jesus Christ. One is what I called an emergency answer, which says that um, Christ had to come because uh, the fall happened. There is a, an, an other ancient answer which says that uh, even if fall and sin never happened, incarnation would have happened because at the moment God, um, the omnipotent and, and loving God, decided to create the world, it was in God's mind to be united with what God has created. And whatever answer one goes with, uh, it tells us that um, the incarnation, the coming to human form of uh, the divine, um, is uh, a wide um, and inclusive idea in Christianity because in, uh, the, the New Testament tells us that um, Christ, um, the second person of the Trinity, is not only the one who reconciles and who is to be sacrificed, but he is also the one in whom the whole world has been created. And so in whom, I mean, in Christ happened creation, in Christ happens the reconciliation, and we Christians also believe that in Christ happens the eschatological, the end time consummation. So in that light, uh, Christians can claim that um, however much there is sin and sinners in the world, one um, sacrifice, one incarnation is enough 
Uh, there are passages, for example, in the New Testament, uh, in the book of Hebrew, which are saying that um, uh, the sacrifice, the incarnation having happened once, no more sacrifices are needed. There are some other uh, facets to your fascinating question, but I wanted to uh, be somewhat concise. <laughs> Hello, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, both of the uh, profound scholars, and I think Professor Jonathan, perhaps you uh, might have opened the can of worms now afterwards here with the question of uh, 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 Jesus' uh, his death on the cross. But uh, of the, to my, my question to the Christian scholar, is it just for a better understanding, is there any reason that it took uh, uh, you know, such a long period of time after, um, uh, after the passing of Adam for God to send down his son. Uh, and uh, I guess the second part of the question is that that was at that time, how about the one, uh, the persons, all, all of the mankind who came after who sinned. So if one son of God has been sent down or to uh, forgive the sins of the humanity, how about the ones after, how do we uh, reconcile that? Is there someone else necessary to come because the one who came, he has already, whether you would like to call it as a payment or uh, someone to come and salvate, uh, bring everyone to salvation who have already passed. But how about the ones who come afterwards? How does someone from the past alleviate the sins of someone from the future as of all of us in this world now? If you could shed some light on it. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, excellent question. Um, I will just... Um add a footnote to my previous answer. Uh, first of all, we do not know why it took uh, so much time uh, between Adam and the coming of Jesus. Um, but Christian theology um, understands that um, uh, for all my, and of course uh, also uh, that's uh, in keeping with Islamic theology, that Almighty God is not bound to time we finite persons are. From our perspective, it looks like uh, the few thousand years or how many um, millions of years is a long time. But uh, we Christians understand in light of the New Testament teaching that the salvific um, plan, for example, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, that the salvific plan was in the mind of God even before the world was put uh, in place. And therefore, in, in God's perspective, um, there are no delays or um, no gaps. And now, therefore, uh, Christian theology also uh, believes that um, the salvific um, work of Christ uh, includes a whole of humanity. Uh, if you go backwards in time or forward in time, that one uh, salvific uh, event uh, embraces, for example, those people uh, who lived uh, between uh, Adam and the coming of Jesus, and as long as um, uh, he um, uh, brings about the eschatological consummation. Professor Hick. Uh, thank you to both of you for the illuminating. Uh, thank you for both to both of you for the illuminating uh, talks. Um, I'd like to just raise the question of merits, merits, this concept of merits. Um, so when one is righteousness, uh, when one is righteous, when there's righteousness, there's merits from the righteousness, um, and those can be transferred. Uh, the merits can be transferred. So this is a very powerful concept in rabbinical Judaism, the concept of zakut avot, that the uh, merits of the patriarchs, the merits of the patriarchs get transferred uh, to the believing community. Um, and then, of course, in Romans, that's concentrated in the figure of Jesus. Uh, he inherits all the merits the merits of his righteousness um, then, as it were, transfer to the believing community, those who are in Christ. Um, so this is a, uh, a question for you, Jack. Um, 
I, I've searched in Islam and I've, I've found certain things that are similar to this. Um, this idea that the, the, the merits of righteousness, right? You have hasanat, right? Hasanat, this concept is very powerful. Um, and there are similar concepts too. Um, but I'm just, this, this for me is, is, a, is an interesting question. Um, it might be a similarity, it might be a difference. It's one of these fault lines that, that, that Dan mentioned. Um, is there anything like that um, that, that, that you know of about transferring merits, the righteous members of the community, the righteous members of the community, their merit somehow can accrue to everyone. Um, actually, I, I talked to Paul before this talk. I s asked him if he would deflect hard questions. <laughs> and I just add, ask, thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. Uh, this is a so in in the in the Quran. There's a very clear idea that. Uh, well, as I mentioned in my, in, my, in my talk, you know, that if you, if you believe and do good deeds, then God takes you at the best of what you've done and pushes aside those, you know, lesser or worse things you've done. Um, so in a way, the, the desire to please and obey God will mean that it's the, the the best face you ever put forward that is the face that you're judged on, in a way, and the day of judgment. Similarly, um, well, a bad deed only counts as one you know, item on the scale. A good deed will count as, as multiple items on the scale. So there's a kind of, um, uh, you know, as I like to tell my students, you know, if they do really badly in the midterm, they do well in the final, you know, we, uh, try and, and fudge the grade a little bit to, to indicate their improvement. Uh, unless that's wrong, in which case I never do that. Um, but the, uh, Another, there's, so, there's also other ways in, in which I think there are similar things to what you're talking about. One is the idea of uh, intercession on the Day of Judgment. And of course, this is, this is controversial because the Quran is very, seems to be very clearly a document against the idea of intercession, the people seeking out intermediaries between them, in, themselves and God. Uh, that's the central message in the Quran. But the Quran also says over and over again, uh, sort of tantalizingly that no one intercedes on the Day of Judgment except by God's will. So there's this idea that there could be intercession. And one of those, the, the, the types of intercession which is um, delineated in uh, well-known sayings of the Prophet Muhammad is the idea that the Prophet himself will intercede for his community on the Day of Judgment, and especially that his intercession is for Ahl al-Kaba'ir, the people who have committed grave sins amongst his community. So those people who really uh, did a lot of bad stuff Will benefit, the, the prophet will step in to intercede on their behalf and to help their, them in the judgment. Similarly, um, you can, and this also comes from sayings of the prophet, which are a very complicated issue because their reliability, even amongst Muslim scholars, their reliability is disputed, their meaning is disputed. But uh, many well-known uh, hadiths of the prophet, sayings of the prophet, also say that, for example, um, martyrs or people who uh, specifically martyrs are able to intercede on behalf also of some of people that they choose, people from their family. Um, is this intercession complete intercession and removal from the testing process or is it just helping out? It's unclear. And then also the, the, the third issue is the possibility of those still alive in the world to assist those in the afterlife. And uh, one of the things that you, know, that you can do, Paul, for example, let's take you as an example. Uh, if you wanted to, you could endow uh, a library, or you could give you know, all your money to me and then say that I should uh, give it to homeless people or something. I, that would then be the Paul Heck endowment for good deeds. This would be called uh, ongoing charity. So those good deeds continue to accrue to you even after you've died. Um, also, uh, you, there's certain things, and these are, just, again, very much debated amongst Muslim scholars, and is one of the central issues of contention between everyone's heard on the news about Salafi Muslims and you know, non-Salafi Muslims. This is one of the big debates between the Salafis and Sufis is to what extent uh, you can do things in this world that uh, can, the, the good deeds can arrive, can reach those people who've already died. So everybody agrees that, um, for example, uh, you can do Hajj, you can perform Hajj for someone who's already died. You can perform the pilgrimage. Uh, that you can give charity for people who've already died. But whether or not, for example, reading the Quran 
as an act of worship? Does those, do those deeds arrive to him? This is debated. Uh, whether or not um, uh, other types of, 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 of charitable acts in this life, going and visiting their grave and things like that, whether or not these can, these also improve the person standing in the afterlife, this is highly contested. And I think that you see in this a real tension in the Islamic tradition between um, you know, acceptance of intercession and uh, you know, hostility towards it. Thank you, Jonathan. Let me add a couple of notes, um, reflections uh, on the merit uh, from the Christian theological perspective. All Christian traditions um, would agree with the principle of Saint Augustine, who said that um, when God rewards human merit, he crowns his own work, meaning that every merit that is due to men and women is dependent uh, on the grace of God. But then among Christian traditions, there are differences about them. I mean, all agree on that. Uh, Eastern Orthodox tradition uh, does not use the term merit at all, because they understand better than most of us that um, all life already is graced, is already the result of the grace of God. So all we do is already like um, antecedently or uh, uh, it's based on uh, precedent uh, grace. And I know these are not Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, expressions, but uh, that's what Eastern Orthodox uh, basically says. Protestant uh, traditions have been um, overly cautious and sometimes even um, uh, overly cautious about speaking of merits at all um, because they have believed that any notion of the talk of any notion of merit may mean that um, the doctrine of justification by faith will be trumped. But uh, Protestants uh, have been, um, the, the Protestant view has been corrected and balanced by a sustained uh, ecumenical dialogue with Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholic theology um, speaks of merits not in terms of being able to, not in terms of human person being able to merit one's salvation, because I said earlier that all Christians agree that only by divine intervention based on divine grace, humans can be saved. But Roman Catholics um, rightly remind us who are Protestants that um, uh, on the basis, when God um, has justified uh, a person, uh, there is a place for good deeds and merits, and in a, in a sense that uh, one's justification may increase, although that is based on, on grace, and that uh, in a limited um, manner you can also speak of a little bit of transferring the merit to others, like through intercession and others. It's a very complicated issue, but that gives you an idea. So if you think of uh, the Augustinian rule, that's the, the basic uh, principle for all Christians, that when God um, rewards our merits, he crowns his own work. Perhaps I could add something here, uh, just to, to come back to the two questions over here, and, and it relates also to Paul's question and, and the answers. Uh, sometimes our, our talk about sin and salvation and forgiveness is, uh, seems like a, a commercial transaction. Uh, this much is owed, this much is counted, this much is paid, uh, this much has yet to be paid, and so on. Uh, and I think one, one of the papers that we will uh, we will be reading in, in our three days, I think it's the one by Susan Eastman, uh, really draws attention to the fact that much of the New Testament is, is trying to break through that notion of uh, that this is a, a transaction, that this is about keeping accounts and paying off things. And I think it's, it's also true of the, uh, the case of the, the Iranian woman that you spoke of, Jack, that in, in a sense, that was that was not a paying of accounts. It was it was a saying, this is a this is a debt which cannot possibly be paid. But nonetheless, I, I refuse. I, I have the right to this. Uh, if you're going to count everything, uh, it should be paid. But let us break out of that that mindset of paying, 
uh, that, that mindset of, of a, a kind of commerce uh, of sin and forgiveness. And I think that is, uh, I mean, your, your questions about you know, how, many, how many sons of God have to die uh, is precisely in that line. And that's where it, it throws back at Christians uh, whether our talk about sin and salvation is, is a talk about, about commerce or whether we have recognized in the cross that here is God saying, uh, this is not about that. Uh, here is God saying, this, this is not uh, about your having paid something which, which ultimately cannot be paid. Uh, it is breaking through that whole rationale of, uh, of totting up things and, and keeping account. So uh, there is, and, and, and that, as we would say, is done, is done by the word of God, which is, in some sense, God's self. It is done by the word of God because God is expressing who God is in that very action. God is, is bearing uh, all the outrages that are laid upon God in, in various ways, and that, that vertical axis that, that Jonathan spoke about, uh, and saying, uh, there is nothing to be paid, uh, in the hope that that is transforming in the hope that, for example, in, uh, in Iran, that the forgiveness of the, the mother of the, the slain son, that her forgiveness of the killer might in fact be transforming of that killer, of his family, of those who witnessed her, her great act of graciousness. Yes. No, no uh, the lady behind you. Thank you. My name is Jean, and I am an Episcopal priest from New York City, a member of the general public. I have a question for Professor Brown. In my understanding of Christianity, uh, Christians acknowledge and experience the reality of God's mercy and forgiveness now. We lead a forgiven life. We lead what we might call a risen life. And sometimes we even enact that with Ritual, we have confession and absolution, and we go forth from that ritual feeling forgiven. But as I hear you talk, it sounds like in, uh, in the Muslim tradition, the, the realization of God's mercy and forgiveness happens only in the afterlife. Am I hearing that correctly or not? Um, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. I think... Um, It's, t it's sort of tough to be the person answering on behalf of the entire religion, especially there's a lot of people who are more qualified than me, like Ayatollah Mohsen Kadivar here. Uh, but it's interesting because I, I may know from my name, I was not always Muslim. I was previously um, poorly educated, uh, non-practicing Christian. But I'd say that um, one of the things in the Islamic tradition is this idea of... Um, you know, the, the forgiveness and in, in God's forgiveness in this life doesn't really, it's sort of unclear how you would measure that. And I was sort of, you know, you know, squirming in my seat when Dan was talking because I wish I could agree with him, but I don't, I think that actually that's one of the big differences, kind of idiomatic differences between the Christian tradition and the Islamic tradition. The Islamic tradition, it's, everything is very transactional. And I think that there is an idea that the Iranian woman's forgiving the, the killer could be transformational, it could... And there, you know you do do things for, for reasons and for you know, the, in one verse of the Quran it says somebody who's feeding the poor and the prisoners you know I only feed you for the for the sake of God. But over and over again in the Quran, uh, you do good deeds to pile up on the day of judgment on your in your, in your benefit on as you're, as you're judged. And the even the martyr, someone who dies in the path of God, there the Quran talks about that as someone who's giving a goodly loan to God that will be repaid with you know, huge interest. And so you know, I think that, I don't know who's a better, capital, better capitalist, maybe Muslims are just better, free market, that you're, you're, you're um, I remember there was this one, um, this one, when I was in the MSA, Muslim Student Association, there was this one guy who came into a meeting and said, I'm not here for you, I'm here for me, I want to go to paradise. And he thought he was, he was teaching a lesson, he thought he was telling, giving a good example. And I kept thinking to myself, I was like, that's a really terrible thing to say. I mean, but that was, I think that was kind of my Christian brain saying, like, ugh, that's not how religious people are supposed to talk. But that, for him, that's the way he expressed his desire to, to do good deeds in the community. And so I think that 
you know, how does God's forgiveness show itself? I mean, it, it shows itself in maybe in the, the comfort that you feel when you pray to God for comfort and you get it. Um, but I think this is often described min as God making, answering a prayer or granting you ease or, but it's not, uh, or mercy, but it's not forgiveness. It's mercy, which I, I think maybe are, are linked concepts, but are clearly linked concepts, but I think of them as being very different. Yes. I'm David Morrissey, and thank you. I'm David Morrissey, a visionary to uh, in Iraq, uh, but not knowledgeable that much about uh, 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 Islam. But uh, as I think of time, we've talked about the sweep of history and uh, the process of reconciliation, transformation, if you like, in Judaism seems to be justice, born out in the Ten Commandments, I am God, honor thy father and mother, and all, all sense of justice. And through that, we uh, sanctify ourselves. Christianity comes forward um, with the transformative value as love, perhaps best in the, uh, exemplified in the Beatitudes. Uh, is there, for the poor layman who's looking for a simple way of viewing Islam, that you might explain in some simpler way the transformation under Islam? Thank you. Again, uh, fascinating question. I think uh, the only thing that comes to my mind is the, when you read the stories of the early Muslims when they convert uh, from being polytheists or Jews or Christians and they become Muslims um, in the life of the prophet and then in the generations after that up until today, I think the, the transformative moment and the transformative key is, is Tawheed. Tawheed is the unicity of God, the total unity of God. And that people's, whatever drives them to become Muslim, it's this um, recognition of the true nature of God that transforms them. Uh, and of course, there can be lots of things that lead them to become Muslim. They see a miracle done. They know someone who's a beautiful person and they want to be like them. They, there's all sorts of of things that can cause them to become Muslim, but I think that moment of transformation is a moment of acknowledging God's oneness. Um, and I, it's sort of a, it would be interesting to write a paper where you, you, know, you actually look at the, the way these stories are told and how that transformation is described. Uh, if I'm right, if I'm wrong, then it would be a bad paper. <laughs> No, man, we, we, we're giving preference to people who will not be out in, in Virginia with us. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you to the both of you. I'm, my name is Zeynep. I'm a doctoral student in the theology department working with Father Medigan. And I'm also a Muslim chaplain here on campus. And my question goes to the both of you. Um, despite the theological differences, um, I see that our witness here on campus and in, in our wider modern culture the common challenge of um, uh, the lack of embracing vulnerability because I, I, as I was listening to you on the notion of sin, uh, there is this tendency in our society to, to reject vulnerability, not to embrace weakness, uh, impotence, which are also inherent elements of human nature within our traditions or understood. Um, but when you meet students, you know, receiving a bad grade or, uh, you know, not getting the the career they want, or uh, embracing things um, in life, I mean, experiencing things in lives which are not really um, uh, positive uh, as they see it. So there is a sense of a, a promotion of self sufficiency, um, you know, self esteem, be confident, be this, be that, so that when you embrace elements of human weakness, that there's a total rejection. And I think that's a common challenge Christians and Muslims face today. Um, but how would you remedy the situation? W would there be any, um, do you have any thoughts on this? Did I? Please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think the, the, the Christian response is a fairly short um, acknowledgement of one's sinfulness, however one formulates it, uh, and acknowledgement of the fact that I'm not able to save myself means that I am acknowledging my vulnerability and that I'm not self-sufficient. Uh, at times, we Christians have done it so robustly that, for example, uh, some atheists uh, have critiqued uh, Christianity uh, cultivating uh, merely self-deflating um, um, uh, attitudes. But a, a sound, balanced uh, acknowledgement of uh, not only of one's gifts that have come from God, and not only the beauty of life, but also sinfulness and, um, and our, un, our, uh, the lack of ability to save ourselves uh, probably would be a good uh, critique of the kind of overly um, successful culture uh, of ours. I think this is you know, a, a, your, your statement is a very good uh, indictment of, of you know, a, a sort of capitalist engine gone out of control, right? That you have, uh, you know, you'd, you'd have to look for, watch TV for five minutes and you're here, you can do anything, believe in yourself, you know, you can go back to, to, to plays like, you know, to the, to the ring cycle of, of Wagner and Nietzsche, the idea that the new man creates himself and, uh, you know, everything, I, I'm a self-made man, and I'm cre everything I, I, I get, like, if, if you want a good dose of this, go watch uh, Matthew McConaughey's speech at the Oscars. It's pretty, I found it somewhat cringeworthy. But I mean, this idea that, you know, we, we are just these self-generated, actualized beings. And then, of course, what happens is something terrible happens to you, and you realize that really you don't have any control. And that's, I think, what, I mean, the Koran very clearly tells a number of stories of this, of people who are you know, living the prosperous life, and then they say, this is from me. I did this. I, got, I, I'm, I'm, I, this is, I deserve this. And then they say, you know, and even if there's a day of judgment, even if I am judged by God, he's going to judge me nicely. And then what happens is God takes, destroys what they have. And they, they, they're you know, crying and um, mourn what they've lost. So I mean, this, I think that you know, Muslims are always saying, anytime they talk about something good, mashallah, this is what God has willed. Anytime you say anything, somebody has a nice car, their kid's cute, you say mashallah, this is what God has willed. Just this utter terror of um, taking credit for the things that, uh, if you're, I think, really honest, acknowledge that were given to you by others, by, by, the, by the God. Matt, I think you had a question. Uh, I'm Matt Taylor. I'm a PhD student here at Georgetown. And <clears throat> my question is for Professor Brown. Um, if I heard your presentation correctly, it seemed like you uh, made the sin and forgiveness on the vertical um, spectrum, and then the reconciliation was on the horizontal spectrum among humanity. Was, was that intentional? And in your reading of the, the Muslim tradition, is there space for reconciliation between man and God? That's uh, I'm probably revealing too much about myself, but I just, all I could think about is the scene in the Coppola Dracula movie where at the end of the movie, you know, Dracula makes up with God and the cross is healed and things like that. And I don't, I think that there's definitely a role, a divine role in the horizontal axis. So the Quran talks about God um, making, f creating brotherhood between people and, and taking people who were previously the worst enemies and making them uh, the closest of friends. So there is, uh, God plays a role in human reconciliation, I think in much the same way that God plays a role in everything in, in the world. So. I don't think there's, that I can think of there's not something special about the reconciliation that involves a divine role. Uh, the, the, um, whether or not you can reconcile between man and God, I think that's a, uh, 
I don't know, it's sort of like a does not compute question if I, you know, Muslim brain is trying to process it. That's just my, my gut response because, I mean, is God gonna apologize for something? I mean, reconcile, reconciliation is this, is a compromise or movement on both parts, on both sides. You know, there's this idea, there's one hadith where God says, you know, those people who come, my servant comes towards me this much, I come towards him this much. He, he comes to me, towards me walking, I go towards him running. But I think that's more of this idea that I mentioned before that, you know, you do one good deed, you get 10 credits. So you just do a little and God will, will go, will, will, will receive you warmly and will, will give you more than your due. But I think that, that reconciliation seems to me to depend on some fault or compromise given by both parties. And I don't think that would really pro compute in the, from the Muslim perspective. That would be my answer. Did I see a hand at the back there? No, no, it was a pen. Oh, sorry, yes. My name is Ken Dante. Uh, my background was in doing therapy, so I think more as a healer than as a theologian, but I think that they're intimately related. Uh, the sister mentioned something about brokenness, woundedness, and one of my incarnations, I work with addicts, and people never really started the journey until there was a sense of powerlessness, of brokenness, and I'd even use the word taintedness, where something felt tainted within, and there needed to be some kind of repair with that. So it was not just so much people disapproving of a person, but it was a separation from self, uh, which is probably a sense of spiritual sickness, uh, on wellness of the soul. You can give it many different names. You can psychologically just say a separation from self. But that is often the impelment of what starts someone on a spiritual journey to heal the self. And rather than saying which tradition is better or worse, I'll think of them as medicines, as traditional medicines. But what's, uh, could you maybe speak more on this topic of self-healing rather than being one theology or another? What types of things have worked for people in healing the self? Please, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to be informed by my brother. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, I guess I got out of it once. Um, I think, uh, well, actually, I think um, you should, afterwards, you should uh, talk to Professor Kadivar because he might be able to talk to you about um, how religious scholars in Iran have dealt with problems of dr drug addiction. Um, and how do you deal with um, people who are addicted to something that's prohibited and in theory subject to punishment, but you're trying to help them get over a medical problem. I, I think that uh, the only thing that came to my mind is as far as I can think, in general, the stories in Islam, and not just from the, the, the time of the prophet, but also afterwards, you see archetypal stories of repentance. It's, um, I, th I think for some, I think they're usually people who are at the top of their game Right? I mean, a lot of times it's people who are very successful, but who see the, um, the meaninglessness or the fragility or their complete lack of credit in this and the kind of the mammon of it. And then that drives them into you know, like a rock star at the top of their game. And then they, um, you know, they sort of, well, like Cat Stevens. It's a good example. I didn't even think about that. He's a, he's a Muslim. So but the other thing is, I think for in terms of therapy, the, uh, the Muslim response is generally, and I think it's a huge generalization, obviously, that you work from the outside in, that your, your outer and your inner are totally linked, and that if you want to improve your inner condition, you begin with outward acts that may even be superficial in the sense that they have no meaning for you at that moment how you do your ablutions, uh, praying even if it doesn't mean anything to you. But by doing these outward acts, you affect the inner part. Um, I, it's, sort of almost, it's very Aristotelian in the sense that you habituate yourself into goodness. And, uh, and I think that's, that's a, a big difference with maybe at, at least the kind of pop Eastern philosophy that you get in American movies and things where you, know, you, have, you reach some understanding 
and then that understanding cures everything. The understanding doesn't work because if you're really sick, you've lost the ability to, to really appreciate or understand things. You have to heal from the outside in. I might uh, ju just for a moment or two. We have we have a couple of minutes left before we go to our uh, uh, our reception. We we have a professor here from Pakistan who who works with drug addict, addict and uh, professor of psychology, uh, Professor Norman Amjad, and uh, perhaps you would like to to have a, a couple of words on the in response to that question. Professor Amjad is part of the the Building Bridges uh, group for the first time. No, you, no, please stand here. You'll be on the video. Just a couple of minutes. Um, while I was listening to other questions, there is something that I wanted to say which would probably answer and relate to more than one questions. And that is what one something that we are forgiving here is relationship between God and man is like a mother and child. You want to please the one that you love. So it's not the forgiveness is not only about avoiding sins and being a good child. It's also about being as near to your beloved as you can. So we, what we are forgetting here in the answers, and I'm not uh, saying to be the sole representative of, uh, of one religion uh, or the other is easy. So I was just trying to help with that perspective is that we are forgetting the love and the spiritual perspective within our own tradition and perhaps there also because that's one perspective which unites all the faiths, which is that we all are um, gifted with the divine nature, the bread of, breath of the God, and I would start, uh, although I'm answering from my own tradition, but I would start with the kingdom of heaven is within us. So if we remember that, your heart needs to be purified to unite yourself with your beloved, and that's the whole purpose of all the exercise in any worship, avoiding sins, or get uh, you know wanting having this intense desire to receive the player and be united and that brings me i think that connects to what the lady here from the church asked as well which is that the real gift of the mercy is when you have this complete inner peace of having in, being in line with the remembrance and that remembrance is each and every moment whether we are in the mosque or in the church or not your work is your prayer your heart is always singing his praise, and you're always remembering him, and that's where the transformation comes. That's where you say, all right, it is here and now, at each moment, not only in the paradise. We were exited from the paradise, but the paradisal state can be within us because that's our true nature, and the purification of the heart would eventually bring you there. So from that Sufi perspective, and I think the spiritual element in, uh, in every tradition, um, to answer about the healing about from the inside and the outside, yes, I do work with the recovering addicts and their families. Uh, and they go through a spiritual process, as you know, the 12-step program. And I've seen the 12 steps, we work that out in Pakistan as well. And it doesn't matter which faith you belong to. And people have found their own journeys to their healing. Whether you are in a disease, a crippling, life threat, uh, threat, uh, lifelong disease like addiction, or you are hurting, or you are mourning, or you have a loss, or you simply have a lack of fulfillment, which despite having everything, as uh, Professor Brown mentioned, keeps you so discontent, and discontent is the modern disease. It's everywhere. I find that all the time in the most affluent people in Pakistan and everywhere else. And the healing that we talked about, yes, um, it can take place through recognizing who you are. It does work from inside to outside and outside to inside. I've, I have um, often experimented with using the, the spiritual practice for aligning yourself with your center. And, and that really works well. And people say, if you don't have faith, there is a moment of peace that you need to find. And from there on, the, the things work themselves towards becoming whole again. Have, have, have I kind of added something? Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. Very much. Uh, we're about ready for our uh, 
to continue the conversation outside, uh, I'd just like to introduce to you uh, briefly some of the people who are here because uh, we didn't actually have name tags for them yet. Their, their name tags are out in Virginia waiting for them, uh, but they're in the district. And just so you know who they are uh, when you're at the, uh, at the reception here, you might like to speak to them. Perhaps I could ask them to stand. Uh, you, you've seen uh, Jonathan Brown and, and Veli Mati. Uh, yes, Mohammed Khalil from Michigan State. Uh, who's, I can't see, uh, Professor Ahmed Ali Bazic from uh, Sarajevo. Who we got? Uh, sorry, I can't see. Oh, Mother Lucy Gardner uh, from Oxford. Oh, Ayman Shabana, Dr. Ayman Shabana from uh, SFS Qatar, uh, Georgetown. I can, oh, uh, Dr. Faras Hamsa from the University of Wollongong, that's an Australian word. <laughs> University of Wollongong in Dubai. <laughs> Sorry, yes, Dr. Afifi Alakiti from Worcester College in Oxford, Malaysian. Uh, Asma Afsaruddin from University of Indiana, correct? Yes. Uh, Professor Philip Sheldrake from uh, Cambridge. The lights are in my eyes, so I can't see everybody. You'll have to stand. <laughs> oh. uh, Professor Maria De Keck from uh, George Mason University. Oh. Sorry. Zainab. Oh, Zainab. <laughs> Professor Zainab Alwani from the, uh, Harvard, uh, the Howard University uh, Divinity School. Uh, Dr. Najib Awad, Awad from, uh, from Hartford Seminary now. Mm, who have we got? Uh, Professor Abdullah Schleifer from uh, the American University in Cairo, Professor Emeritus there. Father Professor Sidney Griffith from the Catholic University of America, also Emeritus just recently, congratulations. <laughs> Dr. Jane McAuliffe, uh, formerly Dean of, of the college here at Georgetown and then, uh, then uh, President of Bryn Mawr College. The Reverend Toby Howarth, uh, who works at Lambeth Palace, who so works for the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, Professor Christoph Schwerbel uh, from Tübingen University. Uh, Professor Joel Marcus from Duke University. Uh, Dr. David Marshall, who's the academic director uh, and also from Duke University. Uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Mogra <laughs> behind there. Catherine Marshall, you were looking for Ibrahim. There he is. Uh, uh, sorry? Lucinda. Yes, and uh, Dr. Lucinda Moshe, who works also at, at uh, Hartford Seminary and who is uh, uh, Associate Academic Director of the, of the Building Bridges Seminar. We've got Professor Janet Soskus from Cambridge University, uh, Dr. Esther Mombo uh, from Kenya. Uh, <laughs> now, don't fight, please. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Brandon Gallagher uh, from Oxford and also this year from Notre Dame. Uh, Dr. Ferial Salem from uh, Hartford Se Seminary. Uh, Professor Amir Akrami, Sayyid Amir Akrami uh, from Eastern Mennonite University. And Dr. Uh, Mohsin Kadevar uh, from Duke University. And I think that's about everybody. So uh, those are our, our participants in the, uh, in the seminar. If you'd like to, to uh, speak to them at, uh, and uh, hear, hear more of what they have to say and advise them on what, the, what questions should be brought up. We already have quite a lot of, uh, a lot of advice from you on what, uh, what should be discussed over these next few days. So I thank you all for coming and I, I hope you will stay with us. There is a reception just outside here. Uh, for the participants, um, you have to take your luggage to the bus. I'm sorry, I lied to some people before. Uh, so we, before you, you go to the bus, uh, which we, we will try to uh, get away uh, just before 7.30, uh, please get your luggage from, from where it was. Uh, but in the meantime, there's, there's plenty of time for discussion and uh, for further friendship. And I hope you will all uh, accompany us with your prayers in the, in the task that lies ahead of us over these, uh, these three days. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>